Good evening and welcome. I'm Adele Gautier from Breast Cancer Foundation and tonight we're talking about fatigue after breast cancer. Before we get started, some housekeeping. If you have any technical issues, you can type in the support in the um, chat box at the bottom left of your screen and our support team will get in touch. Or you can call the number that you see there and talk to someone to get some help. If you have any sound problems, you might prefer to listen on your phone while watching on your computer. You can see some instructions for how to do that at the bottom of your screen. You can use the chat box during the webinar to ask questions, which we'll get to later, and you can actually also chat to other people there. Don't worry about missing out on some of the conversation while you're chatting. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website in the next few days. So, tonight we're talking about fatigue after breast cancer, and we have three panelists who are going to share with you. Trudy Williams, Ros Verlings, Dr. Ros Verlings, and physiologist Megan McEwen. First, we're going to hear from Trudy. She was diagnosed with grade 2 DCIS last year. Yep, last year. After noticing dimples in her breast. Trudy, tell us your experience and what that's meant as far as fatigue is concerned. Okay, here we go. So, I am Trudy Williams. Um, I'm a wife and I'm a mother of two active boys, aged 13 and 8 years old. In August last year, I was diagnosed with grade 2 septal carcinoma in situ of the right breast. Um, this was after I'd ventured on a trip overseas to see family and friends in Europe. While I was away, I noticed the dimpling. I think it was a different light um, in my breast, and I, ha and I hadn't seen it before. I showed this to my husband, and we thought we should check it out, as we had friends who'd had breast cancer and knew this could be a sign. Well, a few weeks later, I went to my GP, and it's been all go from there. Within a week, I was confirmed as breast, it was confirmed as breast cancer. Twelve days later, I had a partial mastectomy. This was followed by four rounds of chemotherapy and then radiation treatment. The medical profession and the care I've been given has been nothing short of wonderful, and I feel really, really blessed. I'm now six weeks post-radiation, and I'm on tamoxifen for the next five to ten years. <clears throat> fatigue. Um, well, since commencing chemotherapy, I've suffered bouts of fatigue, and found the drops in energy have made my life really exhausting at times. This has affected my ability to pick up the kids from school and their sporting activities. Um, at times, my body aches with tiredness, and I dread cooking the family meal in the evening, which I think a lot of you mums can appreciate. <laughs> um, luckily, I've got really, really supportive friends and family um, who've enabled me to cope. If you were to ask me how I've coped and any practical advice, um, the number one thing for me has been exercise. It's been vital in keeping my mood up um, and my energy levels up. Um, I, I do all sorts of things like dancing in the dark, Zumba, walks, anything to keep my energy up because if, my, if I don't exercise, I get anxiety and that I find really tiring. Um, what else? Um, my friends set up a roster by my Facebook page and they organised the three meals a week to be dropped off to my front door. This was by members of the school and my kids sporting communities. Okay, I reminded myself friends, family and community want to help and at times they feel useless. This is the practical way they can assist. I was lucky to be able to hire a cleaner to come in once a week. I accept, accepted all help offered. This includes cleaning, school, sport, pick up and drop off, play dates for the kids and meals. Rest if you need to take an afternoon nap. Take an afternoon nap. Um, keep your water levels up. Keep cool. I found that really important in this hot weather that we've just had. Um, I bought a cooling mat for pets. I know it sounds funny. It's not funny, <laughs> but it works really well. I just slip that under my seat at night. Um, I, took a, I take a cool shower before I go to sleep at night. Um, I sleep with the window open. And I've also got a fan beside the bed. All of that helps me sleep. And I Sometimes linger around the fridge at work a little bit too long. <laughs> okay. 
and keep up pain medications such as Panadol and Ibuprofen that help when I was aching with exhaustion. Also, keep creative. I decided to have fun with my outfits, scarves and wigs. This distracted me from any negative thoughts and that helped keep me positive and more rested, if you want to be honest. Um, and I would meet with my friends once or twice a week for coffee and laughter. This kept me feeling supported and I found it re-energising. If you had asked me what I would do differently, I would ensure I exercised every day. I let this drop off during my last round of chemotherapy and there was a noticeable drop in my energy levels when I did this. My energy eventually did pick up, but that was only after I started daily exercise again. And I would also keep an eye on the creeping weight gain from the drugs as the additional weight really affected my energy levels and also my self-esteem. And last but not least, I'd laugh more. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. Actually, I'd like to know a bit more about this doggy cookie. Have you ever? Really good. <laughs> Do you like electric oil? It's fifteen dollars from Bunnings, and it's, a, it's some sort of gel, but it cools. So if your body temperature is hot, it takes the heat out. Oh. You can sit on the sofa. It's amazing. Right. <laughs> Highly recommend it. <laughs> well, we learn something every day and that's why we have women. <laughs> Thank you so much, Trudy. Now we're going to hear from Dr. Ros Vallings. He's a fatigue specialist who works with patients suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome as well as people experiencing fatigue after cancer. Ros, when does fatigue become a problem and what can you do about it? Right, well, first of all, I think we need to say, well, what actually do we mean by fatigue? And it's something that we all experience. We all know what it's like to feel really tired after exercise or a busy day. And in a general practice situation, it's the most commonly reported symptom. If you think about it, just about every illness has fatigue as a component, even the common cold. So it's not necessarily an abnormal situation to be in, to feel tired, but you have to say, well, what's the difference between normal and abnormal fatigue? And the abnormal fatigue we're going to talk about is the fatigue associated with illness. And I think in cancer of any sort, and <clears throat> we are focusing on breast cancer obviously, um, fatigue will be a feature. And first and foremost, a lot of it's due to anxiety and fear, particularly when people are first diagnosed. Anxiety causes you to feel um, very tight inside and your blood flow freely to your brain so you get more tired. And also, of course, with cancer, one can get very depressed, all the losses, you know, loss of your health, maybe loss of your job temporarily, fears for the future of what you might lose. Depression always is associated with fatigue. And all these issues lead, of course, to very poor sleep. And many people who are depressed or anxious sleep badly. And if you don't get a really good sleep, well, it's obvious that you're going to feel tired the next day. Then the disease itself may have the effect of making you feel tired. It drags down your system, your immune system is in fighting mode and that's an exhausting situation to be in. Then of course you may well probably be moving on to some form of surgery and if you have to have an anaesthetic, that's a bit like a head injury, um, rather like a rugby player getting concussion, you're knocked out for a while and it takes a while to get over an anaesthetic even if it's only been a very short, small operation. Um, and then, of course, there may well be pain, and pain is always going to be exhausting, and the drugs that might need to be administered for the pain um, and other things in the way of treatment. Um, treatment, of course, as Trudy has already mentioned, involves chemo and radiotherapy, and it's well known that both those treatments do lead to fatigue, um, and, of course, there's all the travel to get to treatments and help coping with looking, having children looked after and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of fatigue in relation to that. And then you do become what we call deconditioned due to the um, tendency to rest up perhaps rather a lot during the surgical process and treatment processes and you lose the condition of your muscles and they tend to then get very much more tired when you try and exercise. And of course, as one um, gets breast cancer, 
one is often going to be older, though some very young women do get breast cancer, but a lot of the women who have breast cancer are in an older age group. And the older you get, of course, the more you are prone to tiredness. One always hopes not, but it happens. Um, and menopause, a very real factor uh, which may occur in the middle of all this um, cancer treatment, uh, particularly if you've had chemotherapy or radiotherapy, it can lead to an early menopause when your estrogen hormones drop away, and that's certainly associated with fatigue. And then, of course, there are other illnesses that you may unfortunately happen to have. Just because you've got one diagnosis, it doesn't mean to say you don't have something else sometimes. Hopefully not, but some people get things like rheumatoid arthritis and heart problems, kidney problems as they get older. And all those things are going to add to the fatigue associated with the cancer. So then we move on to say, OK, well, have to accept fatigue is part of this illness. What should we do? How can we manage it? And of course, the very first and most important thing is to recognize the fact that the cancer is associated with illness, understand it, and then for certain things in your life, you may well be able to do things to help along. We can't change your age, of course, much as we'd all like to, but um, there are lots of other things we can do. We need to also be sure of investigating the causes of the fatigue, because often people do assume it's due to the cancer or whatever other primary diagnosis has been made. But of course, it may have other reasons. You may be lacking in iron, or you may have some other health problem that can be very readily and easily treated. Then you come on to what we call a management plan. And everyone who has a cancer diagnosis is probably going to have a management plan. But this should certainly include uh, management and treatment of fatigue. Uh, very much individualized, depends on the age you're at, the type of lifestyle you have, whether you're working or a young mum an older woman living in a retirement village, all sorts of people. And it's all got to be um, organized to suit your particular lifestyle. There will be treatments, of course, for pain and sleep and depression. All those things we've mentioned are really important to be treated efficiently and well. Because all the time you're not sleeping or in pain or depressed, you're adding to the problem of your fatigue. There's always an issue with hormone replacement, which of course women over 45 or 50 would um, often feel really great on because it's replacing the estrogen that has dropped away in your system as you've got older and your ovaries have started to decline, normal fact of life. But hormone replacement is usually contraindicated in women who have breast cancer. Not always. Sometimes your cancer may not be what we call estrogen dependent. And it may be possible to have short course of treatment to help you through the early days or later on when you are still feeling very tired. But this is something you have to discuss, of course, with your GP and cancer specialist. Exercise, Megan, who's on my right here, is going to go into in a minute. Trudy has already mentioned how important that is, and I can't emphasize that enough. We move on a bit, too, to diet. Um, there's no such thing as a magic diet to fix any of this. It's a diet that is going to be nutritious, varied, lots of color, and a diet that you enjoy. No good people telling you you've got to eat certain foods if you really hate them, because you won't eat them. They won't be any good anyway. Um, supplements are something that come up time and again. And there are many people out there selling supplements to cure everything. And if that was so, none of us would be sitting here now. Um, but there are some supplements that are worth considering. Magnesium is useful if you're having sleep problems or a lot of muscle and joint aches and pains. Um, it does have a beneficial effect for those conditions and should be used, taken at bedtime, because it's when it works best um, and you absorb it best. Coenzyme Q10 helps with muscle strength and ability and also brain fatigue. Um, you can get very expensive varieties. I would go for the cheapest because it's usually just as good. Um, if you're a vegetarian, 
Um, you may get low in iron um, and B12, and these things can make you feel more tired. B12 is usually best administered by injection because you again absorb it better, get higher into your system quicker. And if you are dairy products, you might well be low in calcium or vitamin D. And again, these are all considerations. A lot of people benefit from going on to extra salt. And that may be a little bit against what you've been brought up to believe. But um, salt is one of the vital things we all need. And we need a certain amount. And many people have cut themselves right off salt. Um, but it's an important component, particularly if the weather's hot or if you're doing a lot of exercise because you lose salt when you sweat. So having adequate salt through the day can be quite beneficial, particularly for brain fog and um, extreme fatigue sometimes. Mind you, it's not suitable for people with high blood pressure. So they're the group that we would avoid um, extra salt. And you need plenty of fluids. That's really, really important. Moving on down other issues, then certainly stress management is very, very important. Taking on some form of either meditation or um, uh, maybe self-hypnosis, visualization, deep breathing, listening to music, all very, very worthwhile. And also involving other people in your life so that you don't feel lonely and um, different. Um, other people often want to help but don't know how to. So I think it's important that you should let your friends into your life and your relations too, obviously. And of course, having a really good structured day, day um, that you don't just lie around and get depressed and miserable and feeling, you know, life's not worth living. You want structure, getting back to your usual routines and even getting back to work again. Very, very... Um, therapeutic for many, many people. And of course, good bedtime routine, really important, because we want to make sure that you sleep properly. So you wind down, remove all these tablets and electronic devices before bedtime. Uh, you may need medication for sleep. So when I say tablets, I mean computer tablets, because you might well be on tablets to help with sleep. And as doctors, we generally try and prescribe things that are non-habit forming and very safe and very low dose. But you need to take them as directed um, because a lot of people try something for one night and decide, oh, it didn't work, so I won't bother. A lot of the things we use for sleep management are um, certainly needing to be taken for about 10 days before they kick in. And I'm talking here the group of drugs we call tricyclics, which are commonly used to treat sleep and pain in particular. Final thing I'm going to say is the importance of ongoing surveillance. You will have ongoing surveillance, of course, for your cancer, unless you decide to run away. But um, assuming you're a sensible person, you're going to follow the instructions and you're going to do everything you're told, hopefully. But the same goes for things like sleep and pain management and exercise plan. And I think, you know, most people who've been through all this are probably very well motivated. And the outlook nowadays is very, very good for people who really take care of themselves properly. So don't forget to involve your family, friends, talk to your spouse, your children, and so on. And then you won't feel isolated. Great. Thank you so much. There was so much in there. It was really, really helpful. Um, but we're not stopping there. We've got Megan McEwen as our last guest. She's an exercise physiologist, which I have to admit was a new term for me. This webinar. Um, she specializes in using physical exercise as a rehabilitation tool after chronic or complex illness. And I think we'd all agree that this campus is less than still. Um, Megan, how can exercise be a solution to fatigue, and maybe especially for those of us for whom it doesn't come Naturally. <laughs> so, thanks, Adele. So, hi, everyone. My name is Megan McEwen, as Adele just said, and I specialise in working with people with fatigue and chronic pain, depression, and anxiety, and those are all things that tend to come about when you've um, been struck down by cancer. So, I work alongside a lot of occupational therapists and psychologists and vocational specialists, 
um, GPs and um, basically we formulate a plan and help these people get back to life basically. So I guess we should start with what actually is exercise. So it is something different for everyone. Um, so as you get older or as your circumstances change, um, like becoming unwell, um, exercise will change for you too. So while someone may find it a struggle to get to the shops, um, others will find the letterbox is inadequate. So exercise generally is when you go out with the purpose to improve your health. So it's structured and it's intentional. So it's often to try and get your heart rate up, to try and improve your fitness, for example, or it could be to get stronger in your legs, so you could be doing some squats. So when you look at physical activity, on the other hand, that's um, when you're looking at your things like chores, mowing the lawns, picking up your kids from school, supermarket run, so things that you should be able to do without hesitation. So sometimes when you are, are unwell, um, these lines do become quite blurred. Um, and we have to use um, what we can um, and use it to our advantage basically. So for example, if you've got some steps in your house and you're going up and down a couple of times a day, we could make that really, really structured um, in order to try and build your fitness or whatever it is um, that you need to improve on. So basically the idea is to get you back exercising and being able to do that on top of your daily life activities. So as I said earlier, it will be different for everyone, especially when you consider the treatments um, that you may have had, um, whether there's been a reconstruction involved, um, medications you may be taking, um, any other health conditions, uh, the type of fatigue you have, because that can often be quite different between people, um, if you've got symptoms or what the symptoms may be, and et cetera, et cetera. So the list goes on. So how does the exercise help? So there's there's a number of areas of well-being, so it's not all physical, and the thing with exercise is that it can help all those different areas, so it may be your social, your social life, um, your emotional well-being, um, can help with your occupation, your intellectual well-being, all sorts of things. So I've got a list there, um, it's not exhaustive, but um, there's a couple of main things for the possible viewers tonight. So the main things is exercise, it does help fatigue and improves pain perceptions. It enhances lymph flow, it reduces the number and severity of lymphedema symptoms, improves bone health, which is important after a number of treatments, and long-term bed rest. So it improves your cognition, so your memory, attention, concentration, improves your sleep, reduces the risk of more cancer, and it protects against stress, which is pretty important as well. So exercise is extremely powerful, and a lot of people these days are calling it your medication that you should be taking. Um, and there's just so many interactions that are happening in our bodies when we exercise. So many things that you wouldn't even be able to imagine. And so you're never only really benefiting just one system. So when I get um, my medical reports, I'm often looking at all the different symptoms that people have. And so if it's depression, I'm saying, okay, I'll give them that prescription. If it's fatigue, I'm giving them that prescription. If it's something else, I'm giving them that. And it's kind of like a big puzzle that you pull together. So just one thing, if you won't exercise for your fatigue, then please at least exercise for all the other reasons um, that I've just listed above to keep you as healthy as possible and not to mention to decrease all your risk factors like your cardiovascular disease and your diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and just remember that exercise is not all about looking good, <laughs> like some people have you believe. So what exercise does the research do to, um, or say to do for cancer-related fatigue? So research is only really just starting to confirm more repeatedly that um, it can actually help with cancer-related fatigue. So at the moment, a lot of your programs will be based on the standard health recommendations. And you'll see there, I'll put those up on the slide. So at the moment, they're recommending about 150 minutes of exercise each week. So that's 2.5 hours. So that's 30 minutes on five days of the week. But that's not all. <laughs> You've also got two to three wake sessions in there. So that's probably <coughs> 25 minutes a session approximately. So there have been some suggestions of a dose-response relationship. So i.e. the more you do, the better you'll feel. Um, but when it comes to prescribing exercise, um, I'm quite rational. So I'm guaranteeing that most of you are looking at those recommendations and going, nah, no thanks. So at the end of the day, this, this is pretty important, if you can't manage it, you can't manage it. And if you don't like it or if you don't want to do it, you won't do it. So what is actually the point of prescribing that? Um, so results from research can seem quite overbearing um, and just 
simply unachievable. Um, and that's often because they um, don't well, not always consider your other lifestyle factors. So you, you might have a job and the fact that you're having to cook dinner each night and you've got kids to pick up and all those sorts of things. And so that could explain why originally there weren't that many um, favourable results for fatigue. And um, so that's that's a good point. So when it's important to have someone on board that can actually um, pull apart all that research and actually apply the knowledge um, to to you, basically. So it's not a one size fits all model. Um, so it's still very early days on the best mode of exercise for cancer related fatigue. Um, so a lot of the research again is on your more um, your more relaxed kind of exercise, um, so your Tai Chi, your yoga, things like that. And I would say that was back in the day it was more from a fear from prescribing for people who have had cancer. Um, but nowadays they're starting to get a little bit more inventive, so they're using the bike and the treadmill a lot more. Um, so again, these can be manipulated quite well. So they're very controlled, and you can do them in a lab. Um, but even so. Um, a lot more creative even more recently. Um, there's something that came out this year about um, high intensity resistance training and aerobic exercise as well and they were both really, really beneficial results. Um, and it is safe to do resistance training definitely, especially for those with lymphedema. So there's, there's a range of things you can do. So cancer related fatigue, so again it's not all physical so just keep that in mind. So a review conducted last year showed that a multi-dimensional approach is actually um, best for you, so that included physical activity, peer support and also psychoeducation. And I guess the take home note is that it's not all bad, it doesn't have to be um, as difficult as many make out to be and it's not all push ups and running as most of my clients ask me when they first when I first talk to them on the phone. So, so my exercise recommendation, um, so conventional belief has been to rest, so you may rest but please, please, please break it up with activity. So our bodies thrive on movement, so please don't stop. So you're probably all, um, well if you have a look at this diagram up on your left here, um, I would imagine a lot of you will go through this little cycle. So on days that you feel great, you probably rush out and go, oh I better go do the shopping, I better do a little bit of exercise, better go catch up with that friend I haven't seen for a while. And at the end of the day you're just absolutely shattered. And so you rest. The next day you wake up and you're probably feeling a little bit exhausted. Okay, I'll just rest for today. And then the next day you're still you're still shattered. And then the following day you say, oh, I'll start to feel better. And so you start doing all those things again because you want to get them done while you're feeling great. And you can get stuck in that cycle. And we want to break that cycle. So the biggest thing is to avoid those boom bust tendencies. And you do this by pacing yourself and by having a plan. So this is where it's really important to, again, ask someone qualified that stuff and by having a plan. So this is where it's really important to again ask someone qualified that knows about pacing. And so this basically means taking a break before you actually need it. So it's carrying activities out one bit at a time. So an example is your supermarket shop. So it's not totally practical, but you could do your cold goods on one day and then another day do your dry, your dry goods. And so it also means that you can start tackling all those activities that you have on your no-go list as well. Another thing is choose a set time every day or every second day to do some exercise. Start with simple rhythmic aerobic exercise, nice and easy, don't go too hard. A shorter and more frequent bouts is a superior approach than longer and less frequent bouts. So this helps you to form a habit, you recover quickly, it structures your day, helps you to achieve and really importantly it helps you to feel good about it, really, really important. So what to expect once you start exercising? So it's hard enough exercising when you're healthy, let's be honest, let alone when you're unwell and struggling with all these symptoms. So expect a possible increase in fatigue on the day that you exercise and it may last the next day as well, so it's very normal. So it will be challenging and I'd be lying if I said otherwise, but if you expect that and you have an understanding of the process and a plan, then it will make it a lot more manageable. Expect to change your lifestyle. The progress requires change, so it's not just going to go away, unfortunately. So you have to change something in order for it to, for it to improve. Expect to stay in close touch with your practitioner as well. So it's important we understand what's going on, um, and it helps us to provide advice on how to manage it, basically. 
So the fatigue response is different for everyone as well. So we can't necessarily predict the exact path that it will take, but that's exactly why knowing about you, your condition, and your situation, it's all essential, and then we can work this with this to make your recovery faster and more effective. So my overall advice is don't make your exercise a chore. Incorporate it into your lifestyle. So have it as a way to catch up with your friends and family during the weekend, or during the week, sorry. Um, and have it as a way to explore with your children. So take them on a picnic and just work, walk that little bit further. Um, play cricket with them, for example. Um, so while you're boiling your potatoes, do some squats or some press-ups or something against the bench. So you don't have to be a gym bunny at all. Um, if it's going to be included in your life, you have to make it manageable first. So get a specialist on board. Have a plan and pace yourself. That is really important. Rest before you need to. Do less activity more frequently. And finally, your perspective changes when you go to a significant health care. Yeah. And time with the people you love is probably going to be high on your list. So get them involved. They will not only help to motivate you, but you can catch up with them at the same time. So it's two birds with one stone. So just enjoy yourself. Great. Thank you very much, Megan. That was very helpful. And I can see we've got quite a few questions coming up here. So We'll open up to those now. It's not too late to ask the questions. Just type them in the chat box there, and hopefully we should get through all of them before 8 o'clock. So let's just get started. First up, we've got a question for, um, for Rod. Um, so does coffee help in your diet when you have a cancer diagnosis? And I was thinking about this as I was doing Okay. <laughs> well, personally, I have nothing against coffee, but I think, and it certainly does help, particularly with brain fatigue. So a lot of students and people who are um, having to use their brains in their job do benefit from fatigue, from coffee. But I think the most important thing of all is to have your coffee before 2 p.m. Because later in the day, from as early as 2 p.m. onwards, it can interfere with sleep. And we've already said that sleep is so important, and we don't want anything that's going to interfere with sleep. Remember, too, that caffeine is a major component of a lot of energy drinks and Coca-Cola. Um, so, you know, watch your caffeine after 2 p.m. Otherwise, I think it's a good thing to do to kickstart your day if you really want to. Great. Thank you. Now, a question about our old friend tamoxifen. Does that cause fatigue? Um, and this um, person saying four and a half years on, she still suffers bad tiredness at times while on tamoxifen. I've got some thoughts on that, but who do you on tamoxifen now? Maybe? Yeah, and um, the fatigue really set in. I was starting to feel re energised, but it really did set in, actually, when I put tamoxifen. Mm -hmm. Do either of you have direct knowledge of? Well, I think the, the tamoxifen is a sort of anti-estrogen, and we know for sure that when women's estrogen reserves drop away at menopause, they do tend to get more tired. So it's logical to expect one would get more tired with um, something like tamoxifen. That's right, and we do hear often from women that, um, um, that sort of menopause-like symptoms that tamoxifen can bring on does cause a lot of fatigue. So um, you're yeah, certainly not alone if that's your feeling. And I would just um, direct you to one of our earlier webinars, which you'll find on our website, which is about managing the symptoms. Or I think we called it learning to love tamoxifen, which mm. is perhaps a bit too out of three. <laughs> but um, it was actually our best attended webinar ever. So this is a very, very <laughs> common um, problem. I think about 500 people listening in on that one. So do check it out, because we did have some fantastic speakers who gave some good thoughts on dealing with that. Um, now, where, um, let's have one for uh, Megan. Why does um, the body have ups and downs with fatigue? For example, I upped my exercise from 45 minutes to one hour and it almost killed me. That, that's really common. The, the idea is to really gradually increase it, so maybe no more than five minutes at a time, especially if you're doing that on a daily basis. Um, what you often find with fatigue is that um, a normal healthy person, they will um, they'll exercise and they'll recover. They'll exercise and recover. With people who have fatigue, they often go exercise, they recover, they exercise, they recover, they exercise, they recover. And it's almost 
it almost accumulates over the weeks and they sometimes just get to this wall and they just hit it and crash. Um, sometimes, well that's when it's um, a good idea to stay in touch with someone so that you can kind of work out if anything else has changed um, and whether something else that you've done in your day that may have increased that fatigue. But no, if, if you're progressing your exercise, really, really small chunks at a time. Um, but yeah, it's quite, quite normal for that to happen. Okay, and in terms of getting a plan for fatigue, Roz, unfortunately not all of us are going to be able to come and see you <laughs> next week to talk this out. Um, how do people get, who else can people talk Well, to? I think certainly the GP can, or the um, cancer nurse, the GP's practice nurse. But these are all people who, you know, set up plans for other conditions such as diabetes and other diseases, asthma, and so they're used to setting up a plan that probably suit um, an individual person, but of course some people prefer to just set up their own plan. They read up, they find out what's needed, and they're highly motivated to do it for themselves, and there are of course Cancer Society support personnel as well. Jump on there. Um, yeah. Often occupational therapists as well. So right. Not all occupational therapists are based on occupational stuff. Um, they do do a lot of um, daily planning and structure and things like that, so they can also be really, really helpful. Um, and some of them have a lot of experience with fatigue management as well, so yeah, they can be and quite that, useful. Yeah, I think physiotherapists as well. Mm. Yeah. And what's the story with getting a reference um, of being referred to an OT from your GP? Oh, a book thing in the public question. Um, yeah, see, I work with private insurance, so I don't... I don't know how it's not easy usually too it. difficult. I mean, in most areas, there are occupational therapists based in the um, hospital situation, That's right. yeah. and the GP can refer to these people. That's or, of course, your cancer specialist can as well. Thanks, Rob. And it may be that that's not something that leaps to your GP's mind mm -hmm. to the bank, so it could be something to bring up. Yeah, well, I think the that. GP is always happy to discuss that kind of thing because. GP likes someone who presents with positive ideas, you know. You don't want someone coming in and, you know, they've got no idea what they want to do and they sort of seem very negative, whereas people who come in who are really positive and, you know, I want to get on to a management plan, they're usually welcomed and, you know, given a lot of support. Right. Um, now, uh, just a question, Rob, about your comment on buying um, a cheap supplement and not worrying about the cost. Um, someone said, is it best to sort of look for the bioavailability of that? I think, you know, personally, that if, for example, you need magnesium, um, you shop around and choose the cheapest one at the supermarket. This is my own personal advice to patients because a lot of people are cash strapped and some of these supplements are hugely expensive and you're paying a lot for a fancy bottle. Um, so I think, you know, I would go for the cheapest, and I don't think that um, usually it makes a lot of difference. Most people, of course, will get most of their so-called minerals, vitamins, supplements in their food if the diet is really, really good. So the things I've suggested are just additions which you could look on as a sort of medical additive, really. And will a GP prescribe magnesium? Um, well, can recommend. Um, you can actually sort of get it on prescription because a lot of the um, indigestion mixtures are quite high in magnesium. <laughs> so the GP could prescribe it in that way. And, you know, we do. Um, but most people will just buy it in the chamber. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, um, but GPs, I think, can prescribe B12. Oh, yes. B12 injections, very much a GP um, thing. You can get the prescription, the usual $5 prescription fee for up to 12 amples, which is oh. one a week. Um, I usually recommend something like one a week over six weeks. Okay. And the GP's nurse probably will do the injection, and you may well have to pay for that. Do you need to get tested for that? Too? No, the test is not necessarily relevant. Um, most people, of course, have a normal B12 level when they have a blood test, but sometimes when people are very tired, pushing the level up a little bit above normal is quite acceptable and seems to be very safe. But, you know, I think you need to do it in conjunction with your GP as a kind of team approach, really, um, making sure it's suitable for you and that you're getting benefit from it. Okay. Um, now, a question about 
eight sessions. And actually, I didn't quite hear, Megan, how long, I think I was still sort of recovering from the oh. two and a half hours of exactly <laughs> how long the wait time was supposed to be. So the standard recommendation is two to three times a week, um, and that's about eight to ten different exercises for about three, three lots of 15. So that ends up being you know, just under 40 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes. So it's quite chunky. Hmm. Three times a week. <laughs> yeah, so I can't. Yeah, yeah. 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 I almost say you just want to exercise um, at least three times a week. And if that's Pilates and if that's doing it for you, then at the end of the day that's, that's what's important. Um, so yeah, you, you do a lot of body um, body weight stuff in Pilates. So yeah, that, that is still classified as some kind of resistance training. So absolutely, yeah. I think the other important thing with exercise is the person needs to enjoy it because they're mm. never going to keep it up if they don't enjoy it. Exactly. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, they just won't do it. No, <laughs> and no. that's not going to get you anywhere. So. We'd all be the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Trudy, you like it. You're dancing in the dark. I do. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the community places do it, and it's great. Mm. No oh. one's looking at you. oil is an omega-6 omega oil and it's said to be very useful for breast pain, some female hormone disorders, periods and what have you. And it doesn't usually clash with things, but some people take far more than they need because you know, a lot of people think more is better, but more is not necessarily better. But if you're having omega-6, it's quite a good idea to balance it with omega-3, which is fish oil. So you take both. Because sometimes one will leach out the other if you take a predominance of one thing over the other. Mm. Okay. Now, um, is there any harm in high intensity training? Megan, could you maybe just explain a bit about the training? That's the sort of three minute thing, is it? Or yeah, so it's still quite new. Um, so basically, high intensity is generally considered above about 75% of your maximum heart rate. So it's quite high heart rate levels and it's usually short and sharp. Um, so a few minutes at most and then you'd stop and have a rest and then you'd do another um, high fast minute. So it's basically hard as fast as you can, quickly as you can basically for a set amount of time and then rest periods in between. Um, very, very straightforward. Um, you can do it in the gym, you can do it at home on the field. Um, Backyard. Um, but yeah, so there is some recent research saying that it is good. Um, in the past, it hasn't been encouraged, um, but it's just starting to pop through. I just read something today um, that came out a few weeks ago, so I'm going to look into more into that. Yeah. And you're not aware of any harm? Um, I personally wouldn't be prescribing it um, immediately. I would work someone up to that first and wait until we've at least got fatigue sorted um, before I jumped into that. And it depends on what your background is as well. If you've been a regular exerciser and have done high intensity workouts in the past, then you know, I've been more encouraged to give it a little push. But if you've never done exercise before, then no. And that's most of the clients that I see uh, they've never exercised. So the whole thing is quite a shock. And so can we have an example of a plan someone says? So what, what might a plan look like? Or just in general? Um, again, it really, really depends on the person. Um, I would say some recent people have been getting out. I almost say if they're not working, look at it as your job. Um, as soon as you get up in the morning, um, brush your teeth, have your breakfast, and get out something quick. Um, so if you're really not into exercise and if your fatigue's really, really bad, um, I would even say 15 minutes, just a quick walk around the block, um, come home, have a rest, then do something else um, active after you've had your rest, and by active I mean maybe a chore or something like that. 
um, and I'd do that daily and then each week build it up by maybe five minutes. Um, this is very, very general. Um, and then once we've got the aerobic stuff, so your cardio, other people like to call it, um, once that was settled, then I would probably start bringing in some resistance exercises as well. Um, but yeah, again, it just really depends on what your background is, um, reconstruction, all those sorts of things. There's a lot to consider. It's not just as simple as, it's not just a one plan for everyone. Um, so yeah, I'd need to know a lot more I think. Okay. Um, and how do people get coordinated advice across these different disciplines, diet and exercise and medical? Yeah. I think actually if you're under a hospital clinic, you often do get a coordinated mm -hmm. approach because they will often involve the physio, the occupational therapist, the exercise person, um, the medical side of it, yeah. the sleep management, and the dietitian, nutritionist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, often you'll get that um, overall plan set up for you. If you're in the private sector, it's often not as efficient. You know, you have to sort of search around a bit, and often then your GP might be your first port of call or your GP's practice nurse. Well, with public and the physio talks us through um, exercise um, plans. Um, who, who to go to. Um, yeah, yeah. It probably yeah. varies around the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. I'm yeah. sure it does. And I guess it may be about asking that mm. referral too if it's not automatically offered. Well, some people are too shy to ask mm. and I think that's another thing. You've got to start being quite proactive mm. sometimes. And some people don't even know that they might need the help. So if they right. may need a psychologist, which is often quite common, mm, um, yeah, they, yeah. they don't realise that they may need a psychologist if mm. they're avoidant for some reason. Um, yeah, and with relaxation mm. or something like that. Yeah. Mm. And I know that here at Auckland Hospital, Auckland Breast Clinic, there's um, a psychologist that, that, that you can get to, so um, I'm sure that other, I do know that other DHCs have that access as well, so I'm not quite sure if it's as easy. But definitely something to ask about. I think sometimes people are quite nervous about being referred to a psychologist or a psychiatrist because they think everyone's going to label them a nutcase. But in fact, you know, often it's good to go to someone like that to be told, no, you aren't suffering from a psychological condition, but we can help you with counselling and relaxation and that sort yeah. of thing. That's well, not all talking therapies either. It's not just sitting there talking about your background no. and that sort of thing. They actually give you coping strategies yeah. to help you. And those are just so, so important. I think sometimes knowing that it's normal to feel this. Oh, yeah. absolutely. That's the other yeah. thing, to yeah. know that it's normal, yeah. it's not, not yeah. a disease thing. Mm -hmm. If you are out of the um, very active treatment phase for your breast cancer, but you're still getting maybe a six monthly or annual appointment, I guess bring it up again at that um, down the track, even though you're not still having any active or whatever. So don't miss about that at your breast cancer appointment. Um, now, Christy, sometimes I wake up feeling 100 years old. I have bone aches a lot. Is it possible to take too many painkillers? Well, I think it is possible <laughs> to take too many painkillers. You can certainly overdose. And I think if your pain is not controlled with what you've been prescribed, then that needs to be discussed with your doctor or your cancer specialist because pain management now is very, very efficient. And there are many, many options. And there are, of course, pain clinics. And you can be referred to a pain clinic, which are, you know, most most big hospitals will have a pain clinic. And I think pain uh, medication needs to be very carefully managed because it can have all sorts of lasting ill effects if you have the wrong pain relief or it doesn't bring terms sometimes. And actually, I read a study last week that said about a third of people with cancer will have pain management and that's not from any lack of care and attention on the part of the medical professionals but often that pain is higher than people think it's going to be. And a lot of people don't realise that by improving sleep pain is often relieved because mm -hmm. some of the medications we use for sleep um, give you much more of what they call deep level 4 sleep which is the sleep where you produce the endorphins which make you feel good and so improving sleep management is important. Sleep medication. Yeah. Do you have 
is that addiction to sleeping? Well, I mean, when I'm talking pain, uh, sleep medication, I'm not talking the addictive benzodiazepines like um, timazepam and even zopiclonimavane, but we use often uh, the low-dose tricyclics, which are the old-fashioned antidepressants, but we use them in very, very low doses, like 5 or 10 milligrams of a drug that can go up to about 150 milligrams. But those very, very low doses will give you restorative sleep in the majority of people without addiction risk. Um, they need to be taken very regularly. And another option for people who have perhaps a milder sleep issue then is melatonin, which is quite natural, but it does have to be um, on prescription nowadays. That's not addictive either. Great, that was useful. Thank you. And now here's someone who says, um, I started exmestane, that's um, those of you that know that's a, um, a drug like tamoxifen that's taken for long term after breast cancer. Uh, less than a week ago, can I expect to be more tired or fatigued from that? And the Well, you know, I think it's probable that they mm -hmm. will be more fatigued. And it's something, as long as you understand your fatigue, you can cope with it better. And that is something I think um, with that tamoxifen webinar that I mentioned also talks about the aromatase inhibitors like methane and very similar, very similar symptoms. Um, I think any webinar. medication actually for any condition has the potential to cause side effects in some people, and that side effect may well be fatigue. So you know, people who are on cholesterol lowering drugs, for example, can often feel very fatigued, but not everyone does. So we're all individuals. That's true. Now a question here, be careful as I've managed to sprain my hips by gently increasing and using a jog slash walk act. I wonder if tendons are affected by chemo. Or what else might be explained there, do you think, Megan? Are you a runner? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, again, it could be a number of things um, depending on how how slowly you progress the program, um, what other medications you may be on, you may be at higher risk of getting um, or having sustaining kindness and other injuries. Um, yes, I, I, I don't diagnose, so I, I don't actually know, but um, yeah, it's, it's all about being gradual and not jumping from yeah, there's, it's all about being gradual and not jumping from walking to running. And if you are, I would perhaps start for maybe 20 seconds of running, 20 to 30 seconds of running, and then back to a walk. And then after a couple of minutes walk, then try a little bit of jogging again and just go really, really easily. Do it on soft surfaces, the shoes. Um, and so she does say she did it gently, but maybe it's me. <laughs> and two, as women get older, they're more prone to osteoporosis. And if you push the exercise too hard to risk injury, you know, you get broken bones. So, I mean, I think, again, women who can't take estrogen supplements are also going to be a little bit more prone to osteoporosis. So, you know, that's all in the mix, isn't it? That's mm. sort of consideration, really. Yeah, and it's also the first time as well, first time getting back into running, um, that, that can happen. but. Yeah. Slow going. Um, now, here's someone who says, I'd love to return to a weight for my upper body, but lymphedema worries me. After I've completed my chemo and radiation, do I still need to be really cautious with upper body exercise? Way too much. <laughs> You've got that other talk coming up. Um, Maybe. But, um, keep moving as much as you can. Um, don't perhaps don't start with any weights, um, just stretches or just moving in positions like this. Um, just keep it moving to get the fluid moving basically so that it doesn't swell. Um, I pretend to mm. really. Yeah, well that's the thing, you can, but if, if you're just starting, yeah, just yeah. get the movement. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> but no, 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 but yeah, yeah that's no. absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. fantastic yeah. for the yeah. yeah. The other thing that's been mentioned is swimming. Because I think swimming suits a lot of people really well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the water's just in your body. Some have concerns of picking up bugs a little bit more easily, though. When yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, there is. Oh, he's brilliant. <laughs> and um, uh, 
and as Megan alluded, we do have a webinar coming up on this theme in I think a couple of months' time, so it's great. <laughs> 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 uh, keep an eye out for that one. Um, right, what is the difference between going to a counsellor and a psychologist? Well, I think the difference is um, often the treatment is much the same, but the psychologist has more sort of psychiatric medical training and probably a slightly different degree, um, whereas a counsellor has very much more the sort of talking, counselling, helping you through, not so much emphasis on mental health issues, whereas a psychologist perhaps is more trained in mental health issues as opposed to just talk therapy. Right. But often you'll get the same sort of approach. It's a matter of what's available in your area, really. And if you do want a referral for counselling, um, Breast Cancer Foundation does offer three free counselling sessions everywhere in the country. And um, if you have a look on our website, you'll see how to get a referral for that. And you can choose a counsellor in your area that you can see. And some of them are psychologists, and some of them are registered counsellors. But you'll get a, an idea of that from looking their profiles once you've got a referral. Our nurses can give you a referral for that too. Um, we'll put up their number in a moment. If you want to do and a lot of practice nurses do um, counselling as well. And I now know I, in South Auckland, for example, um, there are monetary help for practice nurses to do counselling. So, you know, that's another option to consider, particularly for people who are very short of money. Okay, now someone's just made a comment um, about potential lung damage from radiation therapy, um, and I guess assuming that that might have an impact eventually on fatigue. Um, I guess we would just say that there is sometimes a risk of damage to the lung from radiation therapy, but the clinics are very aware of that. If your radiation oncologist plans your treatment and your dosage and the location of it very carefully, and your radiation clinic will give you training on holding your breath during the during the treatment and so on. So um, I think that there is a small percentage of patients who, who suffer some lung damage, but every effort is made, obviously, to minimise that. And there are very good techniques in place to do that. And give up smoking. <laughs> you know, I know quite a lot of people who are obviously very stressed with a cancer diagnosis. They up their smoking with their smokers. And, you know, GPs generally now are uh, very much aware of the importance of smoking education. And again, practice nurses who work on that. If you've got lung problems, that's the last thing you'll be doing. Obviously, it's going to affect your ability to exercise. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we've got through all our questions here, okay? and um, and it's very good timing because we've just got time to wrap up now. So thank you all out there for joining us tonight, and thanks again to Trudy and Rod and Megan. You've all been fantastic. Um, we hope you found this helpful, and we'd appreciate if you could take time to give your feedback as you exit the webinar. If you have any questions about this webinar or other things, do call our 0800 BCS line tomorrow, which is on your screen. Now, as I said, the nurses can refer you to free counselling and also to funded um, rehabilitation and exercise classes, which might help with some of those fatigue issues. Um, you may also like to join MyBC, which is our online breast cancer community, and you can find a link to that on our website. In a few days, we'll send you a link to the recording of this webinar, which will be available online if you'd like to watch it again or we'll recommend it to someone else. So, all that I can say now is thanks again for joining us and good night.